Hello and welcome. I'm uh, Timothy Wong, Vice President of the American Gastroenterology Association, or AGA. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on potential opportunities for gastric cancer research funding through the Department of Defense's peer-reviewed cancer research program. The AGA is committed to helping GIs understand the research opportunities available to them, and therefore we are pleased to co-host today's event with Debbie's Dream Foundation, Curing Stomach Cancer. I will now introduce uh, Jaffer Ajani, MD, Chair of the Medical Advisory Board for Debbie's Dream Foundation, who will introduce our speakers. Dr. Ajani. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And we appreciate the AGA joining Debbie's Dream Foundation in raising awareness about the importance of funding for stomach cancer research. At the core of Debbie's Dream Foundation's mission is to advance funding for research. Debbie's Dream Foundation has done this in many ways, including through advocacy on Capitol Hill. This year, our advocacy efforts included lobbying Congress to expand those cancers eligible for funding under the peer-reviewed cancer research program to include stomach cancer for the first time. Thanks to the hard work and persistence of our advocates, as well as our champions on the Capitol Hill, both the House and Senate have agreed to include stomach cancer as an eligible cancer, which is a real advance. However, uh, Congress must still pass the final Department of Defense spending bill, and we are hopeful that Congress uh, can complete its work and a new potential source of stomach cancer research funding will be available next year. Next slide, please. Okay, I think we are on slide three. Um, so I'm proud to be affiliated uh, with Debbie Stream Foundation and want to acknowledge the effort, efforts of the organizers, founder and president Debbie Zellman, who has worked tirelessly to raise awareness of the deadly cancer and to support patient community and their families. I encourage you to visit Debbie's Dream Foundation website to learn more, including how to get involved in our advocacy activities. Next slide, please. So today we are honored uh, to have with us uh, the program manager of the peer-reviewed cancer research program Dr. Donna Kimbark, who is also involved in other programs and initiatives within the Department of Defense's congressionally uh, directed medical research programs. Dr. Kimbark received her PhD in molecular pharmacology and cancer therapeutics from the State University of New York at Buffalo in the Roswell Park uh, Cancer Division. She also has a certificate in epidemiology and biostatistics from Drexel University. Following her postdoctoral training at Johns Hopkins uh, University, Dr. Kimbark worked in the biotechnology sector before joining the congressionally directed medical research program in 2002. And she uh, joined as science officer for the breast cancer research program. Her areas of expertise include cancer therapeutics, pharmacology, proteomics, and scientific research administration. At the conclusion of Dr. Kimbark's presentation, there will be a period set aside for question and answers, and this will be facilitated by my colleague, Dr. Adam Bass, uh, who is also a member of Debbie Stream Foundation's Medical Advisory Board. And if you'd like to ask questions during uh, the rest of the session, uh, please type your question in the question pane. Um, so it, at this time, it's my pleasure to turn over this webinar to Dr. Kimbark. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate it. And I also appreciate the, um, the invitation to participate in this webinar. It has been um, it has been very um, very exciting to hear um, that the the language um, in the House and the Senate 
um, includes stomach cancer, one of the things that we like to see in the peer-reviewed cancer research program are um, cancers that are uh, are are the in the gaps, what we call like to call the gaps. They are not uh, funded at a higher priority in some of the other uh, federally funded um, agencies. So um, while we as um, as part of the federal government cannot advocate for a certain topic area to be within the peer-reviewed cancer research program, it's always good to see that um, something like stomach cancer has been added. So if you go to the next slide, please. I'm going to give you a little bit of a primer on what the congressionally directed medical research programs actually is. It started about 20, 25 years ago when um, advocates from breast cancer uh, lobbied the Hill, went to the Hill, and asked for money to go from um, from the uh, peace dividend once the Berlin Wall fell and communists fell in the Soviet old Soviet Union. That money. Um, they wanted to shift to um, health care, and especially women's health care and breast cancer. From then, uh, we had a small amount of money that was put on the Department of Defense's bill uh, for, for breast cancer, and that started the entire, um, the entire movement of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program where advocates go to the Hill each year, they demonstrate there's a need, they ask for um, they ask for money to be added to the Department of Defense bill to Congress. Congress is one of our partners. They add the funds. It's targeted funding towards one program or one disease, illness, or injury um, in order to uh, change how the scope and the um, research landscape actually looks instead of just going with along with the president's budget. The DOD, the Department of Defense, has really um, come of age, I would say, with um, this program. They use it for their program management for other research um, funding uh, opportunities as well. That includes militarily relevant um, opportunities, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in a bit. Um, so it's really becoming a whole, um, a whole a host of people that are partnered with the CDMRP, including the researchers. So researchers, advocates, Congress, and the DOD all come together in order to um, hopefully improve health care and change the way that we do research. Next slide, please. And what I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, what makes CDMRP a little bit different than um, some of the other uh, federally funded research programs. Um, I want to make a point that we are not in competition with those other, pro other programs like the NIH or NSF or anything like that. We are complementary to those programs. And that's really important um, to remember. And one of the other things to remember is that this money is added to the DOD budget. Many people might have concerns that, oh, we're taking money away from the soldier or the Marine, the sailor, the airman. We are not doing that at all. This money is added on top of the DOD appropriation. It, is, it does not come out of the DOD appropriation itself. And one of the most important things to remember about that is that adding this money onto the DOD appropriation helps the DOD in its overall understanding of research and health care itself. So each one of our programs, and we have a whole slew of programs, and I'll show you a slide that shows some of the programs that we have, not all of them, but some of them. Each, each year, our division for the program and how the program is going to work changes, because each year, the program changes, especially a program that has multiple topic areas, like the peer-reviewed cancer research program. Our topic areas have changed back and forth. We've had a listeria vaccine uh, for cancer research. We've had radiation protection, including nanotechnology. We've had blood cancer. We've had um, pancreatic cancer and, and uh, pediatric cancers, a whole slew of different types of cancers. And the money that, that goes along with that has changed from year to year. We can have any, anywhere from $12 million all the way up to $25 million, which was what the appropriation is this year. 
So obviously, I can't say that this is what our vision is going to be for the next 10 years, because I never know what Congress is going to give us any money. They might not give us any money one year. They might give us money in the next year. So we never really know what's going to happen. So we have to plan accordingly with the researchers. And I will talk a little bit about how that happens soon. We have consumer advocates participate throughout the whole process. Um, we, find, we try to find highly innovative, impactful research that other places might not take a, the risk on. We really try to do the high risk, high gain type of, of research because it needs to be done and somebody has to take the risk and that's what we do. In order to um, formulate our vision for the year and our investment strategy as well as how to review the, the um, the full proposals that we get in, we use a two-tier formal review pro uh, process that was first um, recommended by the Institutes of Medicine model, which is um, an important thing that Institute of Medicine watches over uh, a little bit. We've had them review us um, on several occasions to make sure that we are doing things transparently and with integrity throughout the whole process. And as I said, we do try to avoid duplication by filling, fulfilling um, unmet needs and, and niches within um, the research landscape. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, the, um, how the advocates and consumers do interact with CDMRP. And, um, We've had over 2,000 consumer um, organizations represented um, within the uh, within consumers represented within um, the DoD, and uh, they participate at peer review. They participate at programmatic review. We've had them participate within grants themselves. So it's really an important part of how we voice who we are, are really the consumers and the advocates make an important contribution because they really add perspective and passion and really a good sense of urgency to the panels. I have to say this is an important thing for a consumer for, for consumers, especially for cancer for cancer patients or survivors or I I'll, I've talked to some people they like to call it a cancer veteran, um, which I can understand. So uh, this is a really important part to really have your voice heard, and for, especially for cancers that are underrepresented. So this is what we try to do. So um, they are equal voting members throughout our, our peer-reviewed panels. So I'm going to go into a little bit about that right now. I'm going to talk about our... Um, our programs themselves. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, the peer-reviewed cancer research program is just one of many programs. We have $25 million this year. The previous year, I think we had $15 million. You can see that there is a number of programs. This is just a half of the list. I'm, I'm not showing your, you the whole list here. This is just half of the list. You can see that there are many different programs. These programs are more nationally related. Um, we do have Golf War in there as well. Um, and, but we do have other programs that the CDMRP manages that include um, things that are more militarily focused, such as um, psychological health uh, for those uh, veterans that, and service members that might have PTSD, for traumatic brain injuries, for regenerative medicines, and so on. So we really do uh, focus on the military as well as um, the national health care. And um, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the program execution. I've talked a little bit about what uh, putting up, putting together our vision, putting together peer review and programmatic review. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what that all means. As um, was said previously, um, advocates go to Congress and ask for funds to be added to the DOD appropriation. This is when the congressional appropriation, when we receive um, uh, funds, we can then move forward. We, when we have a new program, when a program first starts out, we have a stakeholders meeting where we invite people from um, the advocates, we invite uh, military members, we invite um, scientists and clinicians all to get together and to talk about the research landscape and to tell us what 
is being covered by other research organizations and what are the unmet needs. So that's what happens during a stakeholders meeting. Once we have that first stakeholders meeting, we, we, really, we really don't have it again um, as the, as the um, program matures. But what we do have every year is what we call vision setting. We have a, a group of people, group of experts, including clinicians and, and um, research, research scientists and advocates and members of the military come together and talk to us about what the unmet needs are. And specifically for the peer-reviewed cancer program, what are the unmet needs in these topic areas? Okay, including the military, because peer reviewed cancer, of all the programs that we have that research, do research funding for cancer, peer reviewed cancer is the one that's set apart because of the fact that we are tasked by Congress to each year send them a report to Congress to tell them what the military relevance of this research is. So one of the things that we have to be cognizant of is how we are militarily relevant, how we are militarily focused. What are we trying to do to make the, um, the service member healthier and fit to do their job? And one of the things that I want you to pay attention to throughout um, talking about this and throughout if you decide to um, actually uh, try to um, get funding from this program, it's one of the things that's really important is that we do have military relevance, and the vast majority of people that are treated by the military health systems have never worn the uniform. The military beneficiaries, the service members, and their families, their families are treated by military health systems. And those families, then, are important for military health and care. So it's one of the things to remember. So during vision setting, this is where the gaps are identified, and this is where our investment strategy is identified and recommended to the CDMRP program to say, this is what you should be trying to invest in. Um, from there, we release what we call program announcements. These are like RFPs. Um, and during the program announcements, we'll specifically detail out what the um, what the needs of, of and how to put together an, a free application and an application package, a full application package. Most programs, as um, including the peer-reviewed cancer program, we do um, want to have a pre-application. So we ask for pre-application, which is a small, a small little two or three page um, application. In fact, some of them are only one page application. Uh, we put that together, and then the panel that looked at vision setting, the integration panel that did the vision setting, come together again and do a teleconference to do uh, to select which ones are going to be invited for full application. Once that happens, we have full application receipt, and we do peer and programmatic review. Peer review is done by an external panel of experts. Once again, we have researchers and and um, uh, medical doctors as well as advocates on those panels to review. Those panels are done usually by, um, by topic area. So you'll have a topic area of just of stomach cancer, just of pancreatic cancer, and so on. And then all of those, excuse me, all of those will go forward to programmatic review, where the integration panel that set the vision, that selected which, which full applications were going to be invited, then take a look at what they had done previously, what they actually wanted, and what they got. And this is where we do a comparison of what we want to actually select in order to uh, fund. And from there, the approval, the, fi the final approval goes through the commanding general and the defense health program. And then finally, we do award negotiation, and we monitor that award all the way through the life cycle of the award, looking, making sure that it has progress, making sure that all the regulatory checks are in place, and also um, looking for outcomes for our outcome database. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to talk just a little bit about vision setting and what that vision setting means specifically about the, for the peer-reviewed cancer research program. You can see I have a couple of cogs there in order to put, to put it all together. The investment strategy and the vision and mission are our outcomes for vision setting. That's what we're really looking for. 
but you can see the different things that play a part in that. For instance, the consumer relevance is very is a very important part of that. Um, so we have consumers on our panel that talk about what's needed, that more or less bring the lay voice to our panel. The knowledge gaps are important as well. That's why we have um, that's why we have uh, scientists and clinicians sitting on our panel and telling us where they're where they're having problems in the clinic, what research is done, what research isn't done, how what would help research advance to the next level. We're always looking to leapfrog forward. We don't want to just go incrementally. Also, we have military relevance. Like I told you, the peer-reviewed cancer research program is specifically militarily focused cancer program. It's the only one of its kind at the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program. It's probably the only one of its kind in, in, in the federal government overall as a, as a selected uh, uh, cancer program that focuses on military research. Then um, that doesn't necessarily mean, as I said, that you have to work with military um, populations or anything like that, but that it has to have ultimately um, benefit to the military. And we also look at portfolio balance. What did, we, what did we fund last year and what have we funded in the past? What don't we want to fund anymore? So we also we look at the whole research landscape, but we also look at our internal backyard, essentially. We're looking at the whole world, but every now and then we've got to come in and we've got to do our own gardening in our own backyard in order to see what our investment strategy is and what our vision setting is. And then if you go to the next slide, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about that two-tiered uh, uh, review process. I talked about the peer review and the programmatic review. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to fund the best uh, meritorious, scientifically meritorious proposal to fulfill the program's goals and, the goals. and those program goals are set during vision setting. So the peer review panels look at that that's a criterion based um, evaluation of the full proposal. They go through the criteria by criteria and they they more or less score it and they say what's good about it, the strengths and the weaknesses and the whole panel discusses that. So they're looking for an absolute scientific merit and what we'd like to talk to say about that is that they're looking at each one of those full proposals to the gold standard. Not to one another. They don't do a comparison base at this point. They just look at it to its, how, how it stands up against the gold standard. And then that all of those go to the integration panel, which is our programmatic review. And that's when we start comparing and contrasting. Well, this one got a very high score, but this one over here got a slightly smaller, a slightly lower score, but it's in an area that is not well researched. So why don't, we, why don't we fund that one instead of that slightly higher scored one? So score is not everything. Okay, so that's an important part to understand. And also that we're trying to adhere to the intent of the program as well as the relevance. So if you go to the next slide, I will talk to you a little bit about what our, our vision and mission has been for the past couple of years now. Um, and our vision, if you could go to the next year. There you, thank you. Um, the vision is to improve the quality of life by decreasing the impact of cancer on service members, their families, and the American public. So it's really important, as I said, to note that service members, when they're out there doing a mission, uh, we do not want them to be distracted because they have someone sick at home. And the way that we can make sure that they don't have to be distracted is to make them have of family members that are incredibly, uh, that are healthy, and if they are not, um, if they have a, if they have an issue, of, or if they have cancer, for instance, that they're being well taken care of. That's an important part of the cancer, um, of the cancer treatment, is that the caretakers know that their their loved ones are being well taken care of. So uh, the mission is really to foster the next generation of cancer research by one, providing new opportunities and also looking at high impact research for the prevention, detection, and treatment of cancer. What I have listed there is a list of the different topic areas from 2014. You can see that we've had a, a slew of, of different topic areas from blood cancer to melanoma to mesothelioma. 
uh, pancreatic cancer, and so on. This year, our new uh, two new topic areas included cancer due to radiation exposure, and myeloproliferative disorders. I looked in the in the language for this FY15 year, and I noticed there's no cancer uh, due to radiation exposure. That was most probably a one-time deal because of what happened to um, some of the humanitarian ships that went to Japan after the Fukushima um, meltdown. So um, the investment strategy, if you go to the next slide, the investment strategy for 2014 was all about career, um, a career development award and a, an idea award with special focus, um, and that special focus really um, zeroed in on the military focus. So what the integration panel thought when they looked at the vision uh, for the next year and what they really needed is that they've seen a lot of attrition of new and bright minds in cancer research because of the fact that there's not a lot of opportunities to get funding anymore for these new and up-and-coming researchers. So what they decided to do is to put together a cancer uh, a career development award mechanism. And that career development award mechanism helps new researchers start, um, start up a lab and get moving forward. And they did the IDEA award to um, be specific towards military relevance, where the focus areas are really focused on how to deal with exposures and um, other deployment-related issues that might be um, somewhat uh, uh, somewhat of an issue. Now, if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the portfolio composition. You can see that our research portfolio goes all the way from detection and diagnosis to pathobiology to cell biology. We really try to get a, a slew of different things that will cover many different topic areas and research areas scientific research areas within cancer itself. So um, you can see we're still a little bit thin on primary prevention, endocrinology, and epidemiology. Each year we take a look at this and, the, and our investment strategy and, our, and how we are going to balance our portfolio has changed a little bit more just to balance that off. In the next slide, this is something that people always ask me about. Well, how much money do, are, are you going to put into kidney cancer? How much money did you put into mesothelioma? Each year, this is dependent upon, number one, how much money we get, and number two, our receipt numbers. Okay, I get a very large receipt from, um, from for instance, blood cancer and melanoma. So if you look at the next slide, you can see some of our, um, some of our, uh, uh, the receipt numbers that we get. For instance, blood cancer last year I got 41 full applications, where for melanoma and other skin cancers I got 52. Um, but when you look at um, mesothelioma, I only had eight. Okay, so the, you can see that there's a huge difference in some of these topic areas. And some of it's a little bit about outreach and getting people to know things. And also, some people, sometimes it's, there's not a lot of researchers in that area. And sometimes it's, um, it's that, you know, we didn't strike a chord with people that want to actually uh, get funded. So you can see that for each one of the topic areas, um, we had blood cancer, colorectal, genetic, kidney cancer, melanoma, mesothelioma, neuroblastoma, pancreatic, and pediatric brain tumors. You can see the blue line there, the larger line in each one of those is the full application submission. The funded awards, you can see, are the green bars. The only one that did not get funded in fiscal year 2013 was um, uh, genetic cancer. All of the other ones had at least one, usually two, at least, that were funded. It is my duty. As, um, as the program's uh, program manager and advocate for the program itself is to ensure that every single one of these topics get, get something funded in it. Unfortunately, genetic cancer did not that year. Most years, most years, every single named cancer gets, in fact, I could say every year, every single named cancer gets funded with at least one and usually multiple ones. Um, for uh, for that. So if you go to the next slide, what I'm just going to do now in the next two slides, 
Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the types of awards, uh, awards that we've actually made um, in some different types of um, different types of cancers. And this one, the very first one that I'm going to talk about, Dr. Singamanani, um, is in kidney cancer, and he's doing a really interesting um, study where he's looking for urinary um, biomarkers for kidney cancer. Because trying to find kidney cancer at a very early stage really depends on having CT scans. Uh, and, and, you know, it's usually incidental if you find kidney cancer. So um, what he's doing is a, is a urine-based one where he's trying to get a, a, like a paper-based type of study um, for a, a, a substrate, and it's going to be a very it's a very interesting study. And if you want to know more about that, we are going to be putting up a um, web highlight within the next couple of days on his his work. So we're really excited about that one. Dr. Federick um, is working on pancre pancreatic cancer, and he's screening compounds in order for to look for um, antagonists of um, LR. H1, and that regulates, it's a protein that regulates liver, intestines, and pancreas, and it can be associated with tumorigenesis. And so he's found some candidates, and this could be some novel agents for pancreatic cancer therapeutics, which as you know, pancreatic cancer is one of those cancers that is very difficult to treat and to um, cure. If you go to the next slide. Dr. Yu is working in pancreatic cancer as well, and he's looking for novel, um, uh, novel biomarkers, um, looking for therapeutic response in early stage uh, resected uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma patients. And um, what he's found so far is he's discovered that uh, a low expression of CHD5 uh, predicts a poor outcome. So this is really important to know what you can do and what you can't do. Okay, it's really great to find a therapeutic, but what if a therapeutic isn't going to work and you're just going to waste um, waste time and um, decrease the quality of life for that person um, during during their treatment? So we really have to look at both sides of the coin here, and that's one of the things that Dr. Yu is actually doing. Now, Dr. Hernando and and Osmond are both working; they're working together in a collaborative award um, in melanoma. And they're looking at microRNA analysis for melanoma and have found that the very high expression of a specific microRNA um, correlated with metastatic potential. And this is really important. Like we, we, we know that a lot of cancers um, don't, uh, the, the, their, their survival rate really decreases a lot once it gets spread, once we get to metastatic cancer. So to know, to be able to know if this um, this uh, this microRNA is expressed um, will really tell us where we are and how aggressive we have to treat, especially with something like melanoma. Melanoma is very difficult to stage. It's a very difficult cancer to stage. My, many people think, oh, you have skin cancer. It's quote unquote a good cancer. No, it's not. You know, we don't know when you have melanoma what stage it is. It's very difficult. So. Um, I want to thank you. The next slide is just some contact information for me. And um, I want to thank everyone for listening. I know that was a fairly um, a fast review of everything and how we work. I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, great. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, Adam Bass. Uh, from Boston, and I'll be um, um, moderating a question session. So again, people who are interested in asking questions can send those uh, to us over the uh, web link. And uh, while I'm, I'm waiting for questions from 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 those who are listening, I'll I'll, I'll get things started on my own. Um, uh, so yes, one 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 important question is actually when the applications will be open and also what's the, uh, the, the, the relative time for the uh, applications for the, the letter of intent versus the full application? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things um, everyone should be aware of right now is that the government is currently in a continuing resolution. So we do not have funds yet. We do not have a budget. 
Um, I don't suspect that we will get um, a budget until sometime in January. I mean, it, it might happen next week, but I don't suspect it will. Um, we'll have to wait until the new Congress comes in. Once that happens, most probably they'll pass an omnibus, which is really when they take the Senate and the Congress and the, and the House representative language and they push it together and they just push it through Congress so that they can move forward to the next year. Um, then we'll have our final, um, our final language. Um, if you take a look at the House and the Senate language, there are slightly different. There are some slight differences for a peer review cancer research program. Stomach cancer is in both, so I suspect it will stay. There is a difference in the amount of money. In the House, it's 15. That's one five. In the Senate, it's 50. That's five zero. So they have to come to terms um, and come to and come to conference on some things like that. So we'll find out. Uh, once that happens. Once that happens, we are usually set and ready to go. We're all sitting at the gate waiting because we don't have a lot of time. So we're all sitting at the gate waiting. Um, our vision, our vision uh, meeting is in uh, February. So sometime after February and after we have a signed um, budget, um, once we have a signed budget, we will release the program announcements probably within two or three weeks after that. And um, we usually give anywhere from about six weeks for pre-application um, or that letter of intent, as you said, um, to come in. And then it takes about another couple weeks for us to do the screening. And then after you get your invitation to submit, we usually give about anywhere from six to eight weeks to write uh, for the writing. And then um, you go ahead and submit. Uh, one of the things that I want to make clear to anyone in your audience who has never submitted to the DOD before is to try to go in and get everything, all your ducks in a row, do all your registrations uh, with, grant, with grants.gov and with um, the DOD now so that you're ready, so that if, at uh, you know, 5.55 on the day of the deadline, you're not like trying to get everything in. Okay, it's really important to try to do this prior to that that drop dead date. And the applications are through an online system, is that correct? Yes, all the applications come in through grants.gov. That's the government's portal for grants. It come in, they come in through that. We have them processed, and then they go to peer review. Peer review takes about six weeks. And then there's another a lag time between peer review and programmatic review as we write up what we call the summary statements, which are the products from the peer review that essentially state the scores and the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses. And all that goes forward to programmatic review. Um, once we have it through programmatic review, we will then, um, within a week after programmatic review, well, not a week because we have to have the general sign, and he's a busy man. Um, so a couple weeks after the general, once the general signs, once then we can go ahead and um, move forward with informing everyone of who has been selected. Great, thank you. And there was a, a question um, um, in terms of a, a more scientific question. Uh, one was about how closely the um, studies. Um, the the question is how, how how do the do these studies have to be closely linked? to the needs of servicemen, women, and so, and if the, this questioner commented that the examples that were cited of, of grants seem to be very basic research. Yes, they um, are very um, basic research. That, that This is true. And let me go ahead and um, answer that for you. Because a lot of people worry, oh, I can't, I can't, um, I can't go ahead and apply to this program because I don't have military relevance. Um, or they think, well, you know, I, I can't get to military populations. One of the things that if you look in our previous year's um, uh, program announcement, which you can get on our website there, uh, you can go ahead and look under uh, program, uh, program announcement archives and look at one of our, 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 our focus series. The focus series are very broad, okay? They're very broad for military, and they can be, they can be used overall. They can be very basic studies because the, we're talking about long and short-term impact. The other thing that you could do, if you're really concerned, because every every single one of these have to have a military relevant statement 
um, in the application package. So you have to say why you're militarily relevant, okay? Why is this study militarily relevant? Um, even though I'm doing basic studies, and I'm doing a basic study in, um, in gastric cancer. Okay, how do, I, how do I get that so that it's militarily relevant? One of the things that I, I tell people to do is to go onto our website, go to the peer-reviewed cancer research program page, and click on the little icon that says uh, peer-reviewed cancer research. It's a little program book, and there's a man, there's a soldier on the front uh, with a baby. Click on that, and you can click through it to page four, and there's uh, malignancies associated with military service. Okay, and I have a whole list of malignancies there and some different exposure types. For instance, infectious um, agents, uh, certain herb uh, herbicides, um, and other types of things that could occur that might lead to cancers or it might be a risk factor. Okay, might not lead directly to cancer, but if, you know, as we all know, um, can carcinogenesis is a multi-step process. You add and add and add exposures, you could eventually develop a cancer. So this is what I tell people to do. That's how you write your military relevance statement, and you can you can do basic research. Yes. Okay. Do you um, does the does the program tend to favor grants which are much more strongly military relevant as opposed to those who say we study cancer, people in the military get cancer, therefore we're well, I can tell you yeah. that pe when, when people say that, they, they usually get a, a lower score on military relevance, but military yeah. relevance isn't the driving factor. Okay? okay, It's not the only driving factor. You know, uh, scientific merit is very important as well. So is the impact mm -hmm. to the lay community. Um, so there are a whole uh, different uh, number of things, a variety of things that will, will impact. Now, if I had five uh, different gastric cancer um, applications, and one had an outstanding score in military relevance, and because they really tied it up nicely, and they have a number of different uh, really good scientific merit study. You know, all of that is really high and shiny. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna drive it over the edge, um, and get funded as opposed to something that said, oh, you know, everybody gets cancer, so yeah, the military is gonna get cancer too. Okay, um, so uh, a question that came in, I think, is a, an important one. Um, and so, as you're talking about um, wanting to really go after more innovative, impactful research, sort of the quote high risk, high reward kind of research. So, one, uh, two questions about that. Um, one is, given you're doing your proposed wanting to fund more high impact or sort of sort of high risk work, how strongly do you? need preliminary data regarding that. And the other question is, since you have grants that are more idea grants versus those that are career development grants, are those different in terms of their interest in high-risk work? Specifically, yeah, they, that's, a, is, that's, a really, yeah. that's a really good question, actually. The idea award is really driven by innovation. Okay, it really is driven by innovation. And one of the things I tell my peer reviewers all the time is that I cannot tell you what innovation is because they always ask me, well, what's innovative? And I always say, well, I can't tell you what innovative is because it still would be like me telling you what beauty is. I have to really explain that to you. What I think is beautiful and what you think is beautiful are two different things. So I have to convince you what I think is beautiful. But for an idea award that's really focused on a high risk, high gain, the really risky work that nobody else wants to do because the you know you had some kind of serendipity kind of moments you know at, at a conference somewhere um, no preliminary data is actually um, not required uh, it's not in 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 some cases in some of our our some of our different uh, ones it's discouraged so you know if you don't put preliminary data in there um, you, you're you're not going to get dinged. I can tell you this though: if you put preliminary, if you say that you have preliminary data and you don't put it in, it's going to be questioned. Then why didn't they put it in? You know, that's what you can imagine. I'm trying to imagine what the peer reviewers are going to say as far as what you're putting in your in your thing. If if it's something strong and you can put it in, yeah, yes, but it's usually discouraged or not required. 
As for the, okay. the Career Development Award, the Career Development Award is not as, as, um, it's not as focused on innovation. And in fact, this year, our criteria scores did not include innovation for the Career Development Award because we're really trying, the, the innovation there is for us. The innovation is us trying to find the best and the brightest so that we can foster and nourish their careers. So that's what we want to do first. Um, and we, we, we really try to um, push forward and build a foundation to get these thinkers uh, on, you know, within these topic areas. Great. And there's a, a, okay, um, a, a, a couple small uh, questions I want to be able to, to go through to get everyone's questions. Uh, one quick one, for uh, career development awards, are those junior faculty, are those postdocs, either one? Those are, those are assistant, assistant professor, or I mean, if, you, if you're a research professor, uh, assistant research professor, um, you should have a, um, it's within seven years of your last postdoc, and you should have um, dedicated lab space and dedicated okay. time. So it's sort of it's sort of new new yes. new uh, new investigators new rather than right. rather than postdocs. Right. Um, and there was a question that came up for the idea awards. If those tend to go to kind of the the big established labs, or whether you know junior faculty kind of um, are successful with those grants. Well, junior faculty do happen to be successful with our grants. I mean, we've had a couple of grants that have gone to established um, established um, uh, investigators, um, but and we don't we don't um, we don't discriminate against which one or which which one or the other. But I can tell you this: the Idea Award is usually less money than the Career Development Award. So if you're a new fac if you're a new faculty and you're a new researcher, you should definitely go for the Career Development Award. It's oh. more money. Yeah, that was actually a question. What are the sizes, both in years the and The money dollar for the IDEA Award with special focus is $300,000 over a two-year period. And um, the Career Development Award is um, $360,000. And I believe the period of performance can be for three years. And it's really important to note that we don't, because we don't survive on, on money that comes in, uh, that our money comes in differently than the NIH, let's just put it that way. Once we, once we obligate to you and say, we're going to give you $300,000, your money is set, okay? You don't have to come in and recompete like you spend 150 the first year. You don't have to come in and recompete for the next 150. You're already going to get the 150 as long as you're performing. Okay. Are, um, do you have to be a U.S. citizen to be eligible, and do you have to be at a lab within the U.S. to be eligible? The answer to both of those is no. Okay. And one question was, if you're not based in the U.S., is it helpful to have a U.S. partner in your research? Um, no. I mean, it could, it could help you in some of the things like registering with grants.gov. If you're outside of the United States, I really, really, really want to tell you to get grants.gov, get the, all the registration numbers that you have to get and all of that. Get that started now. Okay. And um, in terms of the actual application, is it similar to an R01 application, you know, with the 12 pages and the, the format with the aims and so forth? It's or is it similar, but not quite. I mean, for the our idea award, I think it's uh, eight pages, six or eight pages long, and um, we do use the NIH bio sketch. We have a statement of work. Aims are included in there, so you know it's, they're similar, but it's a little bit different. Okay, and the review criteria is it the similar sort of five criteria used for the NIH? No, the review criteria is different for every single uh, program announcement. Okay, and that will be in the. Um, in That'll the be in the program announcement. announcement. In okay. fact, I think the idea where with special pro focus only had like three three scored criteria, and then the other the rest were unscored. Okay, now for uh, the career development grant, I think a question that I had, and I think also came in from uh, someone who's listening, um, uh, is. Uh, for those awards, what other grants might make you ineligible? For example, if you have a career development award from the AGA 
or a K award from the NIH. Anything, anything that's covering the the same work. Okay, so, so you can have career development awards from several different places, but number so as long one, as it's not the same project. It cannot be duplicative. Okay, or right. overlap. Okay, that's okay. number two. No duplicative, no overlap. And I, if you're going to tell me that you're going to work 140 hours, 140 percent of the time on this, I know that everybody works 140 percent of the time. But unfortunately, the accountants are going to tell me you can't do that. Okay, so your your level of effort has to be 100 percent, not 140. Okay. Okay, but this, there's not a hard and fast rule. If you have nope. had a K08 award, you are not eligible. No, for not that. not for our career development awards for peer reviewed cancer. No. Um, and um, just looking at some of the other questions that are coming in here. Um, so one was, um, well, one question was you the 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 numbers that you showed were for the full proposals. Mm -hmm. um, how many? Um, uh, what's the success rate of people who put in the initial um, to the initial to the pre the, the pre Yeah, the pre It depends on actually depends on your um, topic area. I would say that people that, for instance, in blood cancer, melanoma cancer, are going to have a, a, a smaller chance than something like mesothelioma. Mesothelioma, I get I, I get probably about twelve or thirteen each year. And you know we usually cut that in half, so they have a 50% chance. But for blood cancer, melanoma, I'm getting hundreds. So okay. you know it, it gets cut down considerably. Sure. And can someone put in more than one, or can you only put in one? You can put in more than one as long as it's not the same. Right. Okay. And um, and is the uh, uh, someone had a. Someone had a question here. Where are the rules and guidelines available online? I think uh, you can look at old, at old. Um, you can look at old ones right now because right now the program announcement um, is not is not out because we don't have the funds yet. But if you go to cdmrp.army.mil, you can go to um, it says funding opportunities up on the bar and go to go all the way down to program announcement archives and then scroll down to peer reviewed cancer research program and you can see all of our old program announcements and get an idea of how um, what we funded and you know as far as the rules are concerned okay well great thank you very much I think this is probably a good time to wrap up the questions and then move on to uh, dr. Wang Thank you, Adam. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Donna Kimbark for taking time out of her busy schedule to walk us through the peer-reviewed cancer research program and for providing this invaluable information to the GI research community. We look forward to continuing to partner with the DOD on research to help combat many of the diseases impacting our nation's servicemen and women. As everyone knows, this is a critical time in the research community with so much potential in the scientific arena and yet so much uncertainty with respect to federal research dollars. It is not only essential that the research community utilize all funding opportunities to help advance GI research, but also to become involved in advocacy efforts in order to help increase federal funding of research. Legislators need to hear from you as to why funding research is important and how this translates into improved patient care. The AGA, along with Debbie's Dream Foundation, is committed to increasing funding um, opportunities uh, by uh, advocating to our nation's lawmakers the importance of investing in biomedical research. I encourage you all to become involved. In about a week, this presentation will be posted on the AGA's website at www.gastro.org and on the Debbie Dreams Foundation website at www.debbiesdream.org. Additionally, if we did not answer your question, please check our websites on which we'll post the questions and answers. Thank you all for participating today.